The title of today's message is called One Day. One Day. And our passage is uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And as we were studying 2 Timothy on Wednesday night, the Lord really uh, dropped a thought in my spirit that I, that I felt compelled to preach upon. Uh, so we're going to be reading verses uh, 6 through 8. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. But here's the premise of what we want to present today. One day, the last altar call will be given. One day, the last opportunity to fulfill a task, a challenge, a ministry will present itself. One day, a certain door will close to anyone that does not seize the opportunity to walk through it. One day, each of us will give an account to the Lord regarding what we've done with what we have been given. And so our goal of the message today is to help us seize the opportunities that God gives us to make a difference in the world. And in the process of that, to fulfill our dreams and our hopes uh, as we serve the living and true God. There's something about surrendering all to the Lord and finding our peace and our fulfillment in life. So 2 Timothy 4 verse 6, Paul writes this. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Father God, may our hearts be wide open to hear your word, to receive your word today. We welcome your Holy Spirit to teach us what we need to know. Help us to hear it and apply it to our lives. And we want to thank you for it already. In Jesus' name we pray. So here in verse number six, we see Paul is addressing Timothy. This is his final epistle, his last written words before martyrdom. He's in Rome, he's in prison, knowing that the end is near. Now, if you get into this epistle, you'll notice, which we won't get into the whole thing today, of course, but there's no regrets in Paul's letter. There's no, there's no, uh, no remorse. There's no things like, I should have done this, or I should have done that, or I wish this had happened, or I wish that had happened. There's simply, instead of that, there's simply an, out, an outpouring of reality that he's giving to a younger man, Timothy, that he would receive and and digest and apply in his life. And by means of the Holy Spirit, by the nature of the living word of God today, God is speaking to us the same thing, that we would hear this word and, and digest this word and apply this word to our lives, that we may be complete and mature and fulfilled in our calling and in our lives. We see uh, in 2 Timothy 4, uh, look at verses 1 and 2, if you would, in your Bible. We see Paul is, is challenging Timothy or charging Timothy. He's saying in verse number 1, he says, I charge you, Timothy. Verse number 2, preach the word of God, right? You know that with that scripture. Be, be ready in season and out of season. Convince and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Verses 3 and 4, just to paraphrase, say that there's coming a day, and really the the day is now, when when people won't uh, stand for sound doctrine and sound preaching. They have itching ears. They want to hear what they want to hear. But you you preach the word of God. You convince and you rebuke people. You you teach them and you you be faithful in your calling. Verse number 5, you be watchful. You endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. And you fulfill your ministry. Timothy, you fulfill your ministry. And then we get into verses 6, 7, and 8, and we we hear this in paraphrase. Everyone with me? We hear this in paraphrase. Timothy, you fulfill your ministry. I fulfilled mine. My ministry is done. I'm over. I'm done. Now it's your turn to pick up your cross, and you fulfill your ministry. I'm, I'm over now. Now it's your turn. I'm passing the baton over to you. And this raises a lot of questions for us at New Life Christian Assembly. So I hope you're still glad you came to church this morning, this early service. Here's some questions for you. Have you fulfilled your ministry? 
Or are you fulfilling your ministry? Or do you know that you have a ministry? Do you know that you're expected to have a ministry? I think that we can say from this scripture, uh, verse number five, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, fulfill your ministry. We read in Colossians 4, 17, I, I refer to this every now and then. In that epistle, Paul was writing to the church of Colossae, and at the very end, he says to the church, he singles out this one guy, Archippus. He says, say to Archippus, Fulfill your ministry that was given to you by the Lord. Uh, be faithful to complete the work that was assigned to you. And we get this idea that the Lord is, is speaking to us today to fulfill our calling, to fulfill our ministry. And to the church of Haverhill at New Life Christian Assembly of God, the Holy Spirit saying to us, have you fulfilled your ministry? And I as the pastor say, not yet. We're working on it. I haven't, haven't completed it, but we're working on it. We want to fulfill it. But in order to understand that, just quickly here, I want to talk about our mission statement. Uh, most of you know our mission statement by now. It's over there on the, you see the word grow in different places of the church. But our mission statement is simply people grow at NLC. So if we say, are we fulfilling our calling, our call, the call of God upon this ministry? We'd have to ask the question, and I would ask you the question, letter G, are you growing and getting grounded in the word of God? Are you, are you getting grounded in the word of God? Because if you are getting grounded in the word of God, we're fulfilling our calling. R, building relationships and caring for people. Are you building relationships with people within the church? This is part of our mission statement. This is part of who we are, what we do. We get grounded in the word. We build relationships with people. Are you doing that? See, if, if you're doing that, we're fulfilling our, our mission, our calling. But if we're not doing that, we're not fulfilling our mission. Oh, outreach and, and, uh, and uh, sharing the word of God outside of the church, missions-minded, community-minded, community involvement, and so forth. I'm so grateful you know, there's several ministries in town that we support financially. And I found out recently that there's several of our people that are volunteering at other, other ministries, like Common Ground Ministries, Somebody Cares New England, uh, Pregnancy Care Center, Salvation Army, New Brothers Fellowship. These are all, you know, ministries outside of the church, but many of our people are volunteering in those areas, uh, putting our thumbprint on the local ministries here in town. I'm very grateful for that. But are you outreach-minded? Are you, are you missions-minded? Are you being faithful to your missions pledge that we gave last November? We support, what, 35 missionaries, Brother Jacobs. You would be interested in that. We have an extensive missions program. But that's only because people are being faithful to give money to, the, to support the missions work. So if you're being faithful to that, then we're fulfilling our, our calling and our mission. And are we, are we, uh, are we uh, do we worship with passion? And not only on Sundays, but are, do we have a lifestyle of worshiping God? I always go back to the concept that uh, our greatest times of worship, well, it may be a Sunday morning where we get excited and we sense the presence of God. There's nothing like corporate worship, guaranteed. But sometimes our greatest means of worship is just worshiping God on our own, away from the church. When we know we're doing right, we're giving God praise and glory. And hopefully in the process of, of this whole thing, of fulfilling our calling as a church, we will begin to ponder and think, what is my gift? What is my contribution? What is my ministry? And I believe with all my heart that the Lord is calling every church to fulfill its purpose. You know, we, some months ago we talked about how we're in, I'm in fellowship with probably 10 other churches in town, evangelical and or Pentecostal churches that have a mission. They, they, they have a certain specialty that they do. They have the certain things that they're good at. And all of us are a little bit different in our calling. But I think, think the Lord is, is speaking to all of us. Are, are we fulfilling our calling to be a witness and to be a light to the world around us? 
I believe the Lord is challenging every pastor, every church leader to fulfill their personal calling in these difficult days. And I think the Lord is challenging every Christian to find their calling and to fulfill their, their local calling within their local church. Now, so let's get into this a little bit. I, this could be a, probably a three-part sermon if, if I'm not careful, but just quickly, we all have a broad calling. There's certain things that we all should be doing, like fulfilling uh, the great commandment. You know, the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and spirit. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's something we all should be doing, the great commandment. The great commission, go into all the world, share the gospel. Well, if you can't go, you know, you can go down the street or across the street or next door. You can contribute to missions. You can be a part of that evangelism process. And the great, I call it the great commitment that uh, wide is the path that leads to destruction, but narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. We're called to the greatest commitment for a lifetime. We're all called for these things. But I think we also have a specialized calling. And everyone here has your own special calling. And I don't have a list of all of them, but just some things to think about. Some of us, our greatest calling is to be a dad or a mom. Or a single parent. That's a tremendously high calling. Some are called to be working in the secular field, letting our light shine in that place. Some are in the public school system, the medical field, um, tradesmen, contractors, rubbing shoulders with ungodly people every day. And that's a calling to, to be in that situation, to let your light shine in that world. Some are church workers, some are lay leaders, some are are making the church function on a weekly basis, doing the things that have to be done to keep it going and, 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 and running on all nine cylinders. Some are called to be dreamers. Some are called to dream with the pastor. May I refresh your dream today? Whatever happened to the dream, we haven't talked about it in a, in a while, of a new facility. What about a dream of Tim, you'd appreciate this, a, a coffee room so that the carpet in the sanctuary doesn't get like it is right now. <laughs> so, so colorful with stains. <laughs> what, about a, what about Sunday school classrooms for our kids? What about a fellowship hall that could seat 100, 150 people? A kitchen with, with modern, up-to-date facilities? What about a youth room that's not going to fall down? And we pray every winter that it won't, but it hasn't, thank the Lord, but... What about the dream? What about the dream? See, some people are called in the church to, to support the dream of the pastor and the dream of the leaders. Don't forget that dream. Don't forget what we said three years ago. Don't forget, we, we can do this. We, God has something special for us. Some people are called to simply be a Barnabas to a pastor or to the church. You know what a Barnabas is? An encourager. You can do this. I'm happy for the church. I, I'm here all the time for the church. I'm with you. I, I, my heart is with you and all that you're doing. I, I, I support what you're doing. See, some people are called to do that. I've been known to say every church needs about 10 of those types of people in the church. I believe that. So, in any case, Paul is at the end of the line here. He's saying, my role is done. Timothy it's your turn now. So we're going to talk about verses 6, 7, and 8 quickly. And then I want to give you some, some tips on how to find your particular calling. Sound like a plan? All right. Verse number 6, Paul says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Well, I had to think, what in the world is a drink offering? You know, the, the drink that refreshes, go have a glass of iced tea? No, he, this is, has Old Testament roots. The drink offering was what, the, it was a glass of wine, actually. The priest would sacrifice the animal on the altar and kill the animal, and there'd be blood spilled out on the ground. And as the final, uh, the final work of that sacrifice, he'd get, take a glass of wine and throw it on the ground, uh, signifying that the, the offering was finished and complete. And Paul's saying, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. 
My life has been a drink offering. Now it's being poured out because the end of my life is coming. And there's even some reference in this saying that he's anticipating his blood is going to be shed. Philippians 3, 7 and 8 says, Paul says, I've I've counted everything I've had as loss that I might gain Christ. You know, all his accolades, all his Jewish, uh, you know, the Jewish things that he accomplished in, in Judaism. He laid it all down that he might follow Christ and gain Christ. And I wonder if there's some application for this today. Are we being poured out as a drink offering before the Lord? In other words, are we giving our life to the cause of Christ? Of course, we have to work, we have to make money, we have to take care of the kids, all that. But in in the background, we've given our life to serve Jesus. He says in verse number seven, which really doesn't need a whole lot of explanation, but I fought the good fight. I just like the idea of of fighting, of, of being engaged in the battle. See, some Christians aren't engaged in the struggle. They're just kind of passively going along and going for the ride. But Paul is saying, I fought the good fight. I know what it's like to be up against demonic forces and spiritual forces and, and people that are opposed to me. I, I fought the good fight. I, I, I've been engaged in this battle. I know the difference between good and bad and right and wrong. And I've been fighting the good fight. He says, I finished the race. Some Christians don't even realize we're in a race. We're in a, we're in a, a competition, if you will. We're in a, a struggle, if you will. But he finished the race. He says, I've kept the faith. He says in other places, when he wrote to Timothy, he said, some have departed from the faith. They relinquished the faith. But I've kept the faith till the very end. I think we said on Wednesday night, we're talking about a time frame of probably 35 or 40 years since Damascus Road. 35, 40 years later, he's saying, I've done it all. I've done all I can do. I never looked back. I've, I've fought this fight. I've, I finished the race. I've kept the faith. I, I, I did all, I've done all I can do. And I like, I like what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, I regret this. I regret that. I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry I did that. I should have done this differently. None of that. He's just, he's what you would say, satisfied. He knows death is coming. And he's looking back saying, I laid it out. I'm all right, and I'm ready to go. Hallelujah. So many of us live our lives with regrets. Regrets become stumbling blocks. They become obstacles for us to overcome and to get over to do, to do what we're supposed to be doing for the Lord because we're discouraged or we're, we're second-guessing ourselves. And listen, we all make mistakes along the way. But you know what? If we keep our eyes on the cross, the Lord will help us through those difficulties. Even if we make a mistake, the Lord could redeem that mistake. I've certainly made my share over the years, but I've never take, taken my eyes off the cross. He'll redeem those mistakes. And we always have Romans eight twenty eight to fall back on, that all things work together for the good, for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. So anyway, he kept the faith. And then he says, verse number eight, this is it. No regrets. I'm not looking backwards. I'm looking forward. I know that there's reserved for me the crown of righteousness for all that love God, that serve God. And it's not only for me. It's for anyone else that loves God and serves God. Paul is basically saying, I've done all I could on this side. I have no regrets. And now I'm going on the other side, and there I'll be blessed and I'll be rewarded by the Lord. I have no regrets. I'm actually excited about going on the other side. So this Christian life that we have is very unique, I I think. Trying to explain the way that we live and think is really different than the unsaved. You know, a few weeks ago I talked about my my three amigos in New York. Remember that sermon? My three friends. And I I need to follow. I haven't been that back since, but I need to follow up and talk with them more because I want them to understand that My lifestyle, our lifestyle, is different than a lifestyle of an unsaved person. The way we think, the way we do things. I think about my life, those guys are thinking, Rick, why did you leave New York? And my response is, I got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Lord sent me out. That's why. And so we need to understand when we're a saved person, we're led by the Spirit of God. Only God knows what's in store for us. But I encourage you, 
to, to do your best to fulfill your calling here, to know your calling here. Anyway, Paul's life was unique. A couple of things here, Philippians 4. He said this, whatever state I'm in, I, I find myself content. Whether I'm up or down or abased or abounding, whatever I'm in, I, I, find, I find contentment wherever I am. And it's certainly portrayed in verses 6 through 8. He's facing death, and he's content with that. That's pretty amazing. 2 Corinthians 11 I call this the great sufferings of Paul. Won't go into it, but you know, the shipwrecks, the hunger, the, the, the beatings, the, the imprisonments, uh, the, the, uh, the weight of caring for other people, all on his shoulders, the sufferings of Paul. But he learned to be content in that because it comes with the territory. Philippians 3, you know, I already re referred to it, but all things that were gained to me, these I've counted as loss for Christ. Why can he, how can he say that? Because of 2 Timothy 4, 7. I fought the good fight. I, I finished the race. I kept the faith. So yeah, when you're in that mode, no matter what comes your way, you're going to come out on top. No matter what difficulty will come, and difficulties will come, but no matter what comes your way, you're going to come out on top because Jesus is your Lord. Jesus is your provider. Jesus is your deliverer and your protector. I, I came across a, a video clip. I want to show this right now. It's, it's only two minutes long. It's a video clip of Billy Graham preaching. I don't know when it was. I would, I would estimate probably in the 70s based on the style of clothing. 70, okay, good. I didn't even notice that. So based on, anyway, <laughs> 79. But listen to what Billy Graham said way back then about our walk with the Lord. Nowhere in the scripture does it teach that you are to search and pursue happiness. You find happiness as you do your duty. You find happiness as you lead a disciplined life before God. You'll have periods of happiness. It's not a goal. Our goal is to obey God. Our goal is to do the will of God. Our goal is to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we move along, we will pick up happiness here and there along the way. If you sense a longing for God, a desire to change and be a new person, that's God speaking to your heart. And as you respond, he will give you the ability and the power to change because he has to do the changing. To delay makes the right decision harder. And indecision in itself is a choice. You decide tonight that you're going to wait till some other time, that's a choice away from God. And your heart gets harder, the Bible says. And the next time you have an opportunity to come to Christ, your heart may not be as ready as it is tonight. Christ can fill that cosmic void in your heart. The purpose and the meaning of my life, Christ can give you the answer. He can fill that cosmic void in your heart because that void in your heart is made because you are made in the image of God. And without God, there's a void there that only God can fill. Nothing else can fill it. Marriage can't fill it. Drugs can't fill it. Sex can't fill it. Alcohol can't fill it. Friendships can't fill it. The church even can't fill it. Relig religion can't fill it. But the person of Jesus Christ can fill it and can give you a brand new life from tonight on if you're willing to accept the challenge of Christ who loved you so much that he died on the cross and rose again and is alive tonight, ready to come into your heart and into your life. I think the problem is many people have come to accept Christ but haven't gone the next step. And so they're feeling frustrated or they're feeling uncertain or they're still looking for some type of happiness outside of the will of God. Isn't the church, not this church, but the church at large filled with people half in and half out? Isn't that part of the problem? So I want to, I want to talk about three things. I'm going to have to move quickly. But on how to, how to find your calling now that you've accepted Christ. I like what, what Billy said there. That God could fill the cosmic void in your heart. Isn't that awesome? The cosmic void. You ever think that, you know what, something's wrong with me. I'm healthy, I'm, I have everything, I've, I eat well, and 
but something's wrong with me. That's a cosmic void, a cosmic spot in our lives because God did make us in his image. And when we don't have him in there, there's something missing in us. But here's the first thing I wanted to share, just three things quickly. Now that you've accepted Christ, uh, we're talking about finding your calling. Number one is to really, really know intimately your maker. In other words, the more we get to know God, the more we see who we are in God. Personally, I I can look back on my, my Christian life, and when I accepted Christ, man, yeah, I got to know God. I... I almost couldn't believe that I knew God, and God knew me. God loved me, and I had a relationship with God. That was pretty amazing. But in that relationship, I realized that God, who made me, made me for a reason and a purpose. And the more I got to know God, the better I was. Psalm 139 is a, is a great psalm. I, I highly recommend it in this concept. or in this, in, in this concept. But verse 14 says, I will praise you, O oh God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, how could, we, how could David say that? I think he could only say that because he knew God. He knew God in, in a way that he knew God made him fearfully and wonderfully. He said, marvelous are your works. David's saying, Lord, you made me, and I'm, I'm marvelous. I'm wonderful. You know, he says... Uh, Uh, This my soul knows very well. Well, how does this soul know that? Only by having a relationship with God. So let let me reiterate this. God loves you. God has a purpose for every one of us. And as we pursue God, we just go through the whole story. John 3, 16, he came to give us hope in life. He gave us a savior, Jesus And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace we're saved through faith, not of our good works. It's a gift of God, right? And Ephesians 2, 10, for we are his workmanship created for good works that we may give glory to God that he prepared beforehand. See, he he knows us so well. He knows what's in here. He knows what we have to offer uh, him uh, back to him. He knows what we have to give to other people. But in order to release that, we must know God and pursue God and, and run after God. I, I, I read this book recently, and, and the author was trying to explain how to get to know God. And he said, you know, if you want to get to know a painter, you look at his artwork. If you want to get to know a musician, you listen to their music. If you uh, want to get to know an author, you read their books. Well, if you want to get to know God, you look at what God created. And man, when you look at what God created, you can't help but think, our God is so awesome, so creative and powerful. The leaves that are getting ready to change. People come to this part of the country just to see God's creation. The ocean, the storms that happened. All the things that happen in life, the the valleys, the, the mountains. All the things that God has created, the weather. You know, and, and then you look at people, for goodness sakes. Pamela and I had an opportunity yesterday to have a house blessing. We went to someone's house to, to bless their house. And in that house, there were people from Nigeria and Philippines and Great Britain and USA. I said, man, we're like the United Nations over here. Everyone was so different and so beautiful. And God made each one. I thought, man, we're all so different, but we all have the same God. Look at, look at the beauty of God in us. So if we want to know, you know our calling, we really have to get to know God better. The closer we are to God, the more we find ourselves. Which brings us to number two. To, to, to know our calling, we've really got to discover our gifts. Let me be practical. This isn't, we don't have to go to, You know, we don't have to go to 10 years of college to figure it out. What do you like to do? What are you good at? What turns you on? What 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 gives you passion in life? You know, what what is what is uh what's the thing that kind of grabs your attention? What's your skill, your interest? What do you like to do? Um 
I, I'll guarantee you every one of us has a gift inside. We have something that we could give. You know what my first ministry was at my church when I first got saved? Painting the trim of the outside of the building. You know why? That was my gift. I was a house painter. I could paint, man. I could paint. Any volunteers to paint the church? Yeah, I could do that. Man, that's my gift. I could paint. My second gift was, who can play an instrument? We need some music in the church. Well, I play the guitar. Well, bring your guitar to church. Well, that was my gift. That was, that was my, it was nothing really special. It was just something that I liked, I liked to do and that I could do. And it goes on, different things, you know. One time I, I was called upon to lead the men's basketball team of our church. You know who we played against? The, the local prison inmates. <laughs> and after, after we did that a couple of times, I was a referee one time, and I said, man, I will never be a referee again in the basketball game. That wasn't my gift. I could play, but I couldn't referee. But anyway, what do you have? John 6 talks about the, the little boy. Remember, 5,000 people are hungry. And Jesus says, well, you know, what are we going to do? What, uh, go find something. And Andrew finds a little boy with five loaves and two fish. And that little boy gave his, his gift, his offering to the Lord. Andrew brought it over. And with that little offering, the Lord fed 5,000 people. It wasn't so much of the gift. It was the heart of the gift. Whatever he had, he gave it. And I think that's a principle, first of all, to discover, you know, just think in a practical way. What do I like to do? You know, when my father had retired from his painting business, he was probably in his late 70s at this point. He found out in the local public school where, where he lived in New York that they were looking for volunteers to help the first and second graders, I think it was, read. And my father volunteered to help these little kids. Now, for my father to do that, I would have never thought that was his gift. But he really enjoyed going to that school, sitting with those little kids and reading little children's books to them. That was his, a little gift he had. And I'm saying in, in a church setting, there's probably a hundred different things. You know, we have some people, right, and Priscilla, thank you for the cleaning ministry. We have some people on that cleaning ministry that actually love to clean. They love to clean. I said, man, I will get you set up tomorrow. That's my gift. I love to clean. I, I said, man, you came to the right church. Some people, that's not their gift. Some people think it's their gift and it's not. But, you know, that's another story. But I would say, discover your gift. And it doesn't have to be, you know, rocket science. Find out what you like to do and, and, and put it to, into work in the local church. I saw Ramses. Where's Ramses? He stepped in and stepped out. Ramses recently volunteered to do the hospitality ministry. Set up the, the, you know, the refreshments and make the coffee. He likes doing that stuff. It's a perfect fit for him. Jesus is driving the, the church bus right now. He loves to drive. He drives for a living, actually. He's picking up people and, and you know, different things. So find your gift. Tim, nursing industry, nursing ministry, first aid stuff. All, I, I could name everybody. You know, it's good. But here's the third thing. <clears throat> you got to step out to fulfill your calling. Yeah, I, I love when, I, I remember years ago, before I was a Christian, I, I knew this guy. I, I had a friend. And, and we had a mutual friend. And this, this guy was a really good singer. And my friend said, man, he's a great singer. I said, yeah. Well, I had a little, a little chip on my shoulder at that time. <laughs> and I said, yeah, where is he singing? Oh, he doesn't sing anywhere. He's just a great singer. I said, well, he's not really a great singer if he's not singing anywhere. If he's got a, if he, he should be singing if he's a great singer. He's not. Who is he? That was my. But the point is true. A lot of people have a gift, but they never use it. They never do anything with it. Oh, I got the gift. I could do this and that. But they're not doing a thing with it. I'm saying it's time to step out. It's time to say yes. It's time to, to volunteer. It's time to do something. Matthew 14, story of Peter walking on. Everyone criticizes Peter because he fell in after a while. But he's the only one that walked on the water. He's the only one that stepped out. Everyone else was too afraid. He stepped out. I'll, I'll trust you, Jesus. You know, he walked on the water, for goodness sakes. How do you do that? Well, you keep your eyes on Jesus. Spiritual application, I can definitely relate to that. You want to be a pastor, Pastor Rick? Oh, I'll be a pastor as long as I keep my eyes on Jesus. If I don't keep my eyes on Jesus, I'm falling flat on my face. 
So the calling has to be, you know, focused on the Lord. But we must step out. We must step out. We have to begin somewhere. You know, my, my first uh, minis- another ministry of teaching in a Sunday school classroom. You know why that started? Because someone asked me and I said, okay. That's all it was. I was finished with my lesson in five minutes and had to stare at everyone for 30 minutes, but that's another story. But I did it. It was the beginning. Someone said, now that you're playing guitar, why don't you be a worship leader? Oh, okay, I'll be a worship leader. I said, yes. Then my pastor told me, it's time for you to pastor your own church. I said, oh, how am I going to do that? He goes, you have to pursue it. I made a phone call, and the rest is history. That was 24, 25 years ago. But we got to, st- in other words, I would have been frustrated if I stayed where I was as an assistant pastor, I did all I could do. I was, I did, I was okay, but I, there was something in me. There was more. And I had to step out to do it. And I made a, the famous phone call. I hear there's a church in Webster, Massachusetts. Where's Webster, Massachusetts? Well, so I want to encourage you, church, to, to find your, fulfill your calling. Know your maker, right? F- discover your gifts and step out. And do your gifts. I'll go back to Colossians 4, 17 and 2 Timothy 4, 5. Archippus and Timothy. Just do it. Just do it. Fulfill your calling. Well, you might say, well, you know what? Let me remind you of something. Abraham, I'm being polite, exaggerated the truth a few times. Moses stuttered and had a bad temper. Gideon was fearful. David was too young. Later he was too lustful. He had a bad temper too. Peter was just Peter. Timothy was timid. And then there's me and you. What's our excuse? (laughs) There's no excuse. This is what I'm saying. Everyone has something to prevent us from doing anything. But one day we'll be held accountable for what we've done with what we have. I just want to close with these three scriptures. I'll just refer to them. 1 Corinthians 3. Each one's work will become clear for the day when the Lord returns will declare it, revealed by fire to test what sort it is. Romans 14. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We call it the Bema seat, the judgment seat for the Christian. Each of us shall give an account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each may receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. So one day, church, one day, we'll give an account to the Lord. Not not for salvation. We're saved. We're good in that regard. We're talking about a judgment of works. And don't you want the Lord to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come on into my rest well done. But see, in order for that to happen, it's got to begin now because the time is short. On a side note, did you know that some Christians are saying that next Saturday, Jesus is coming back? September 23rd. I read it. (laughs) Not Not that that means anything, but people are saying it. And of course, we can't say the date he's coming back. We can say he's coming back soon. So, With that thought in mind, let's get on with our Christian life and experience and do what we can do to win the lost and to support the work that the Lord has called us into. One day, one day, let's stand together.